Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association first Friday of the month meeting. We're here every first Friday of the month, and we're really pleased that you have joined us. We have people on Facebook, we have people in person tonight, and we have people on Zoom. We do need to remind people um, in the room that a Zoom picks up all kinds of noises. So please make sure that you don't do any talking at all during the meeting, um, because we may, in fact, even be able to understand what you say. So, um, uh, so we would appreciate your doing. You're um, trying to maintain as much quiet as possible in the room. Um, we're really delighted to have everyone here in spite of the fact that in Tucson tonight, it's a fairly rainy, cool evening, and uh, we don't get a lot of those, but people are not too happy when they come. So, um, so we're glad to have everyone that, that we have joining with us now, especially those that are here in person in spite of the weather. Um, we have uh, a speaker tonight who is going to be with us on Zoom, and, um, and so we will switch over to that in just a moment. Um, our speaker is Dr. Eric Huff, and uh, he's going to talk with us about dark matter and dark energy, and he's just a delightful speaker. So, Jim, if you're ready, we will start. Hey, Eric, you can go ahead and uh, start talking and share your screen. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm coming to you from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. So uh, I gave my, my first public talk on this new space telescope, Euclid, uh, about a month ago. Uh, uh, not long after, a couple months ago, actually, not long after these first raw images from the telescope were released. A lot's happened then, and so I'll catch you up on it. Um, but Euclid is at the very beginning of its mission. So mostly tonight, I'm gonna to talk about what we're trying to do and why and how it works. So these are some of the early public release images that came out since, uh, since my last talk. Um, uh, this is a, an amazing new capability and I'll get into what these images mean to us and why they're so important. But all of the material that I'm talking about is available uh, from public information sources in particular, from the European Space Agency's uh, Euclid mission blog and from resources at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and elsewhere. So first, just a word about me. Uh, I'm a staff scientist at JPL. That's the cluster of buildings in an unusually green California on the left over there. Uh, but I grew up in Bullhead City, Arizona and went to college in Tucson. So I spent a considerable amount of time in my undergrad uh, in that very room. Um, and then I did my PhD at Berkeley and spent some time at The Ohio State University before ending up here. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is maybe most famous for the Mars rovers uh, and the robotic exploration of the solar system. Uh, that's curiosity there on top. We operate the Deep Space Network, which uh, talks to most of NASA's outer solar system and near Earth missions. So that's the control center for the DSN uh, on the bottom right there. But we also have a thriving, a thriving astrophysics di uh, division, and we are heavily involved in trying to understand just how the universe ticks. So uh, I'm one of a number of scientists here who focus on dark energy and dark matter. Uh, and uh, this place also has a long history in this subject. So if I walk outside of my office door here and look up at the Catalina Mountains, I can see Mount Wilson, which is where really a lot of this got started where uh, Hubble did uh, some of his pioneering work, and most particularly for the purposes of tonight, where the expansion of the universe was first discovered. So since this is a, an avid uh, amateur astronomy association, I think a lot of people know this story, but I'll just say a little bit about it. You know, measuring distances in astronomy is one of the hardest things. And the way that this was done in Hubble's era, and even today, is with Cepheid variable stars. 
looking at the pulsing of the light curve of the Cepheids, which is like uh, that shown in the top left here, uh, you can infer just from the period of the pulsation how bright they are. And if you know how bright they are, you know the distance. And the thing shown on the right is from Carnegie Observatories. It's still in the archive over there somewhere. That's a, a few blocks down the street from us, uh, where you can see in Hubble's handwriting the realization that what he first thought was a, a nova turned out to be a variable star. And that determines the distance uh, to what people thought maybe was a, uh, just a nebula uh, and turned out to actually be you know, another galaxy. But the most important discovery for our purposes tonight was the discovery uh, using those distance measures of the expansion of the universe. So this is from Hubble's original paper. Quantitatively, it's completely wrong, uh, but we actually qualitatively, the same trend holds up even today. And what you're seeing is a plot where on the, the bottom axis here, you're seeing the distance to nearby galaxies as measured with Cepheid variables in Hubble's day. And on the y-axis, you're seeing the redshift, a measure just of the recession velocity from us. And what Hubble noticed and what has been confirmed uh, many times since then is that galaxies that are farther away from us are moving away from us faster. And it took some time to figure out exactly what this meant. But what people eventually realized is that, you know, especially once these distance uh, measurements extended out to very great distances and the pattern continued, is that this is a pattern uh, of universal expansion. So uh, this, this, the universe is expanding apart. And I made a little visualization to sort of show you what we mean by that. Imagine you take a piece of paper and you put a nice grid of dots on it, right? And then imagine you stretch the paper out in different directions. You know, maybe you've stretched it and you've got this new red grid of points. You can sort of see, I've just taken the, taken the, the paper and expanded it in every direction. Now, if I imagine this grid of points to be representative of places in space, right? And I imagine I'm standing on one of them perhaps one uh, over here, and I see, and so I don't move over time, but at a later time, things have stretched, then it looks to me, if I'm standing right here, like everything is expanding away from me, right? The points that are farthest away have moved the most. But someone else standing in a different spot, perhaps over here, would see the same pattern around them. So we have a pattern of expansion of the universe, which looks like it is centered on us, but that everyone would see centered on them. So this is physically extremely significant. And uh, sort of to, to skip over a, a long physical story, uh, it was realized that the rate of that expansion of the universe depended on what the universe was made of, how much matter there was. And the reason for this is that the rate of that expansion is just set by gravity. All the material in the universe pulling on all the other material in the universe, it was thought, should slow that expansion down. And until the 1990s, uh, from Hubble's day until almost the end of the 20th century, the big question was, is there enough matter in the universe for it to slow down, stop expanding, and collapse again? And that's the curve marked closed here. Or is it going to keep on expanding, but just slowing down forever? Well, in a discovery that earned uh, several people Nobel Prizes, when the measurements finally got good enough to determine this in about 1997, it turns out that neither of these things was the right answer. And in fact, the universe was accelerating apart, that all those galaxies moving away from each other on that big cosmic sheet are moving away faster and faster over time. Now, how can this be? What does this mean? Okay. And to explain this, I'm just going to, you know, uh, I apologize a little bit, but I think most people have encountered something like this, or at least understand it intuitively. So we'll say, maybe you remember from high school, Newton's law of gravitation. You know, the force due to gravity between two objects and on the scales of the universe, the ones that we're talking about here, that's the only force that matters. All the others cancel out. Gravity gets weaker as things get farther apart as the inverse of the square of the distances. Generally speaking, to work out how I have to steer my car today, I don't have to worry about how matter is distributed on the other side of the universe. I just have to worry about the stuff that's local to me, right? So how do we need to change this if gravity is the only force that matters on large scales? How do we need to change this in order to produce something that explains the accelerated expansion of the universe? Well, if something's accelerating, there must be something pushing up. And 
In order to explain that, you need something that acts repulsively. So that's a plus sign instead of the minus sign that indicates that gravity is normally attractive. So you also need it to increase, to get stronger as things get farther apart, because everything is getting farther apart, but the acceleration means that you know, things are speeding up. And if things get stronger as they get farther, if this repulsive force is stronger as things get farther apart, that means it has to be weaker as things get closer together, right? So inside our solar system, where we can actually do precise measurements and fly spacecraft, this extra repulsion that you need in order to explain the accelerated expansion of the universe, this is almost completely negligible. It's tiny. So right now, the Voyager spacecraft uh, is you know, a little over 100 AU from our solar system. It's been coasting in that direction since its last encounter with the giant planets. It was launched in the 70s. And to get a sense for how, how small this is on solar system scales, right, where we can fly spacecraft and do experiments, Voyager has moved about an extra 10 microns, so less than the width of a human hair, because of this repulsive effect over the course of its entire mission. So this is really, really hard to measure. If you want to see the effects of dark energy or whatever is causing cosmic acceleration, the universe to accelerate apart, you have to do measurements of things that are separated by very great distances. So people worked this out in the late 90s and early 2000s. And by 2006, the community had decided that we couldn't explain away these measurements of the accelerating universe, but we didn't understand them either. And they laid out a program uh, that determined essentially what we thought uh, it would take to really shed light on this, to, to see and understand and provide some evidence for what could be causing this accelerated expansion. So that was 2006, right? And we've fiddled around with ground-based experiments trying to revise our methods since then. But the big flagship projects, the things that are really gonna teach us something new about the accelerated expansion of the universe uh, are the things that I'm showing from here. So the first of these, which uh, is a European Space Agency space telescope is Euclid. And this was launched in July of this year. There's a large ground-based telescope called the Ferro Rubin Telescope, uh, which many of the people in the building at Stewart are involved in. Uh, that will be completed in 2025 and it will have first light then. And then the last of these, the NASA flagship mission, the same class as James Webb and the successor to James Webb, not a replacement, but you know the same kind of thing, that will launch in 2026. So what this means is that those of us who are trying to understand fundamentally why the universe is doing this very strange thing, we've been waiting since 2006 or 2005 for these missions, which are just beginning to happen right now. So now is the time. Now we're beginning to get the first data that can really start to tell us something new about dark energy. So, what is the Euclid Space Telescope? So Euclid weighs about as much as a normal sized elephant, about 2000 pounds. It's a, about half the diameter of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a three mirror anastigmat and it has, and the thing that's really remarkable about it is that it has a half a, more than half a square degree field of view. So uh, it's both an optical and an infrared telescope. I won't talk at all about the spectroscopy, but it has a spectroscopic channel. And it's been sent out to Sun Earth L2, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit. And it's going to sit there for six years and map the sky. So what I'm showing you on the right, on the top and on the bottom are the two cameras that are on board this thing. The top one is an optical camera uh, built in Europe, and the bottom is an infrared camera uh, built here, or delivered here by JPL uh, as a part of our contribution to the Euclid mission. Uh, so each of the little, uh, squares that you can see in the top image, and they have counterparts in the bottom one, uh, is, a, a, is a single uh, near-infrared optical detector. So each of those is about 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. So the plan, once this, once this mission got started, was to essentially image all of the bits of the sky that look out of the plane of the Milky Way. We're interested in truly large scales here. The team behind this mission is not designing science to, to look at the Milky Way itself. And so in this projection, the plane of the Milky Way is here, this sort of S-shaped thing. And the colored regions are showing you where we're planning to look. 
So this is about 15,000 square degrees. And this is the first thing that I think where makes it really easy to see why Euclid is so unusual by the standards of normal large astronomical telescopes. So on the top right here, I'm showing you comparison in size of the Euclid detector planes for the visible and the near infrared cameras. So each square here again is a single 2K by 2K detector. And on the sky, these things are large enough to encompass the entire full moon. For comparison, the field of view of the James Webb Space Telescope of the largest camera on it, near cam, is this little tiny yellow square here, right? Uh, Hubble's is a little bit smaller than that as well. And these are the equivalent of trying to sort of look, hold a needle up at you know, the arm's length and peer through the eye of it, right? If you set out on a project to make a map of the sky in order to do the dark energy science we want to do, it would take you a century uh, to do that with Hubble or with James Webb. Euclid's extraordinarily large field of view is the first thing that really enables us to do this. So uh, here it is on the left being finished. It gives you a sense of the size of the telescope. Uh, and it sets sail for Cape Canaveral uh, in April of 2023. And uh, the launch, so there are better pictures of this, but this one is mine from my cell phone camera. I was there on July 1st when the mission went up. So. Uh, that's a Falcon 9 rocket there in the distance. This is the middle of the Florida summer. It was almost 100 degrees and humidity that you could just about swim in. Uh, and, you know, the team has been working on this for more than a decade, right? So we're all gathered there. Uh, and there it goes. So that moment was pretty cool. So that launch was really extraordinarily successful. Uh, and Euclid arrived at the second Lagrange point, uh, Earth Sun L2, uh, and started turning on the cameras uh, and trying to make sure that everything worked. Uh, and the instrumentation at first seemed, uh, everything seemed to go very well. Uh, uh, Ground-based telescope, actually Megacam in Hawaii, caught an image of, of the, the spacecraft bus uh, in uh, live. So I thought that was pretty cool as well in the seventh. So here's what we mean by Earth Sun L2. So when someone says it's going to go to the Lagrange point, you know, if you haven't thought about this or haven't been exposed to it, you might think that's a special single point in space. Uh, but the Lagrange point really is a collection of stable orbits here. Uh, and to give you a sense of the scale, so the blue line is the trajectory that Euclid will follow for you could follow for its first few months. Uh, and once it's inserted into orbit, it will sort of follow a similar loop like this for a long time. For comparison of scale, the gray circles here are the orbit of the moon around the Earth, which is the blue dot. So uh, Lagrange point two is really a vast region of space, and it's three times the distance from us on average uh, that the moon is at its furthest point. It's there because it's going to be especially dark, uh, but it's about as far away as we can easily maintain good enough communications to get all the data done. So the mission was a success. The mission is launched successfully. It's in orbit. And now we're off to map the dark universe. So I'm going to talk a bit about how we do this, right? We're trying to, how, how, does, how do the images that Euclid is going to take tell us about the expansion of the universe and dark energy? And just what do I mean by universe here anyway? So here's the universe. And what I mean by this is that uh, you have to remember, and I think most of you know most people here do, of course, that light travels at a finite speed, and the universe is finitely old. So if you look in any direction, there's a sphere around you that's set by the speed of light times the time since the beginning of the universe that comprises all the things that you can see. So here's you in the center of that. And the blue stuff on here is what you would see if you could make a map of all of the matter in the universe and take a, a simple cross section through that region that you can see. So if you could see everything, sort of a God's eye view, all the matter in the universe, you would see a map kind of like this. And on this scale, galaxies are much, 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 much smaller than a single pixel of the map. So you're really taking the fully, fully zoomed out perspective, all right? Uh, here's the cosmic microwave background. That's the edge, that's the, the edge of what you can see. It's the afterglow of the Big Bang. I won't talk about that, but that's an epic saga all on its own. 
And then nearby us, uh, in the relatively recent past, we can see you know, large bright galaxies from ground-based telescopes like, uh, like this one, the Blanco in Hawaii, in uh, uh, Chile. And then this region right here, the last sort of third of the age of the universe, uh, that's the region where dark energy starts to become important, where it starts to matter and affect things. So if we want to know what this is, we have to look in this region around us in space. And uh, a thing you'll notice if you look at this is that the texture of the map isn't the same everywhere. In the region nearby us, where this is a little bit more purple, and it look, look, probably looks to you like it's a little bit clumpier, right? a little bit rougher if you could touch it. Right? And if you zoom in here, at the center where I've drawn a little diamond, you know, you would see structure. And here again, even in this zoom in picture, the galaxies are where the little bright points are. They would individually still be too small to resolve with your eye. But you see this sort of built up filament and voidy kind of structure, right? And if you were to look at a map of the mass in the universe way over here at the outer edge, you know, you would see something that is less built up. It's smoother. Sort of the variation around the mean is less. And if you could touch it, it would feel less rough. So it turns out that that texture of the distribution of matter, if you tell me you have an idea for what dark energy might be, what you're telling me is you have an idea for how that repulsive force uh, changes with space and time, what its effect is. That's enough once you've told me that the thing that I can predict with math and with physical theory is how this texture changes from the outer edge of the map, to the center, here where it's smooth, to here where it's rough. If I make a graph of that, it would look kind of like this, where this is sort of the clumpiness of the map at the outer edge here. And this is, in a, you know, as the map, as you go towards the center, closer to us and more recent in time, uh, it gets more and more clumpy. And different models for what could be causing the accelerated expansion of the universe essentially have the effect of changing that extra repulsive force. And that changes how long it takes gravity to collapse these structures and make stars and galaxies. And the differences between those kinds of models correspond to the differences between the different colored lines here. So if we wanna tell the difference between different ideas about what dark energy could be, different ideas about how gravity works on large scales, we have to find a way to make this map, right? There's just one problem. For reasons that are probably unrelated to this whole discussion, Almost all of the material in this map, almost all of the mass in the universe is dark matter. We can't see it. It's invisible. So in order to do this measurement, we have to find a way to map the invisible distribution of dark matter in a significant fraction of the entire cosmos. And we have to do that to roughly 1% level accuracy. How do we do that? So that's what Euclid was built to do. Right. So if you could look at the distribution of matter, you would see something like this. You have this black filamentary voidy stuff that you can't see. And there are these little islands of light where the galaxies are. And how you know you can see that they trace each other. But we need to somehow find a way to take the galaxies we can see, the golden stuff, and use that to figure out where the dark stuff you can't see is. The way that we do that is with gravitational lensing. So on its way to us, the light from those distant galaxies, as it passes near these massive filamentary structures, the gravity of that stuff makes it take a slightly different course. And that means that the images of the things that we can see in the great distance, you know, distant regions of the universe are slightly distorted. So we can, if we can measure those distortions, then we can work out where there's more dark matter and where there's less. Make that map that I showed you on a couple of slides ago. And that is exactly like looking at a, different, at a scene through a piece of glass, and working out where the glass from the distortions that you can see where the glass is thinner and thicker. So I have made a simulation of what this actually looks like or would look like with a telescope like you. So this is a simulation of stars and galaxies drawn from a, you know, um, with realistic properties. It's covering a tiny patch of sky so you can see the effects that I'm talking about. And uh, this is about one arc minute, which is about the smallest detail you can see with a naked eye. So if I have a patch of the sky that looks like this, and I add a big clump of dark matter right there where I've drawn the red circle, right? And I look at the effects of that on the stuff that I can see. Uh, this region here sort of 
is characteristic of what Euclid is trying to map, of the effects we're trying to measure. And if I blink back and forth, you can see that we're talking about some really small effects. So this galaxy right here, if you can see my mouse in the center, changes shape a little bit. Um, but for the most part, we're looking for effects that you can't see with your naked eye. So to do this, we have to understand the effects of the telescope optics on the shapes of the things that we can see and separate that from the real distortions that gravity imposes on the images of these distant galaxies. And we have to do all of this, again, to just incredibly, incredibly accurate uh, precision. So um, the other thing that makes this a really challenging measurement, here I'm going to switch screens very briefly, is the scale of it. So the data I'm about to show you are not from Euclid, but this is one of the best tools that I know of to give people a sense of the scale of the problem that we're trying to solve here. So we're talking about, so this is from a set of ground-based telescopes, some of them at uh, Kitt Peak, actually not far from you, some of them in South America, uh, that have made sort of the best, uh, the best mosaic of, the, of the, as much of the sky as we can uh, that currently exists from the ground. And uh, you know, what we're trying to do amounts to looking for uh, tiny distortions that are affecting the images of the galaxies that you can see here, as I said in the previous slide. But if you think about how many galaxies we're actually going to do this for, right? So here's a massive cluster. Um, and as we continue to zoom out, you get a sense that, you know, we're really talking about not tens of thousands of measurements of galaxies, not hundreds of thousands or millions, but over 15,000 degrees of sky, we're talking about 1.5 billion galaxies. So a footprint not that dissimilar from what you can see here and the stark patches the plane of the galaxy. So that's what Euclid is going to try to map. So uh, these uh, from back uh, the beginning of August are the first light images from Euclid. Uh, so once the telescope was switched on, uh, we got fantastic data uh, with seeing that's about a tenth of an arc second. And you, know, you, get a, you can sort of see what we have to deal with here. So I've just tried to impress on you the difficulty of the measurement. But when you look at the raw data, you, know, you have globular clusters. Uh, the, the point spread function resulting from the optics of Euclid makes this six-pointed star here. Uh, so we have to be able to distinguish that from other real effects, of course. And then you can see, you know, in space, you have a much higher rate of cosmic rays than you might be used to on the ground. And then we have to figure out how to deal with and subtract image ghosts and other optical effects. So this we thought we, this we know how to do, we think. You know, there's been years of work by, you know, almost 800 scientists uh, on this particular problem. Um, we also have a spectrograph, and I, I won't talk about that, but people can ask me about it in, in the Q&A if they want. But as the first data started coming in during the commissioning phase, we realized that something was wrong. So right here, the circled area in the focal plane, it turns out there's a fine guidance sensor which takes the state of the telescope and tries to work out how to keep it pointed. You know, these are these are significant time exposures, uh, significant length time exposures. You know, uh, some of the the parts of the sky we're exposing are going up to 20 minutes, and uh, the telescope started slewing away from its target in the middle of exposures. And so that took some time to figure out. And the last time I gave a talk on Euclid, uh, we did not yet have a solution. So the, the European Space Agency and their industry partners were at that point working over time to try and figure out what this was. We were all worried that it might be a hardware issue. But on the 5th of October, uh, they had uploaded a patch. Uh, they had determined that the problems had been fixed and we could begin taking science data again. So we're a little behind schedule, not too much. To give you a sense of what this was actually doing, so this is one of the images that the survey released showing what happened when the telescope lost its pointing lock. So we're sitting here integrating and everything looks fine, and then suddenly this bright star ends up all over the image. And uh, that is, that is a, a point spread function that you don't want to have to think about trying to to correct for. So 
Uh, fortunately, this has been fixed. So where are we now? So right now, uh, Euclid has released uh, its first, uh, uh, it, the first real reduced science quality images. Uh, so these aren't uh, primarily useful for the main science survey, uh, but they are sufficient quality to demonstrate that the telescope performs uh, up, to, up to expectations and to uh, sort of show what it can do. So we'll start with this one. So this is on the left, uh, Hubble's image, the 23rd anniversary infrared image of the Horsehead Nebula, which is a favorite Hubble target. And this at about the same scale as a one hour exposure from Euclid. It's a three band composite of the visible on two of the infrared channels on the telescope. So uh, you don't just get the Horsehead Nebula itself, but the whole environment uh, around it. And you can really begin to sort of put the pieces together, not just of what's going on in the Horsehead Nebula, but how it's shaped by the star forming region. Around it. So this is a one hour exposure of IC342. Uh, this is really extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, it's another three band composite. And this one's hard to see. Uh, I don't know if anyone can point to it in the sky, but it's actually almost totally obscured by the disk of the Milky Way. So the right is a, an image from the WISE space telescope, but it's another infrared telescope. And that little faint fuzzy blob here is this galaxy. And this is the plane of the Milky Way right here. And the only reason you can see it in this image is that this is also an infrared telescope. But uh, Euclid's infrared channel really allow us to peer through dust and get much more accurate measurements, even as we start to get a little bit closer to the plane of the Milky Way. So. And then here's the Perseus cluster. So you can see if you, so, you know, you can definitely see the clustered bright galaxies in the center of the image. But if you were to count, you would see that there's more than a thousand members of this cluster, which is one of the most massive galaxy clusters in the whole universe visible. This is a five hour exposure. And here again, we have this, these three bands, the Euclid visible and then the two infrared bands making a composite. Now this is the first image that I've showed you that's actually comparable uh, in its depth and in its target to the main science survey images that we're going to try to look for. So around the center of this cluster, uh, there are you know tens of thousands of distant background galaxies behind this thing that are the smaller, fainter things in this image. All of those have been gravitationally lensed by this cluster here. And so one of, you know, our task is to extract from that the tiny distortions in these distant background galaxies that will, that will, would let us make a map of the dark matter cloud that this cluster sits in. So that's, that's what we have. So where are we going next? So I showed you this before, but I put the timeline on it. So this is a six year mission. Uh, and at least prior to the software fault that led us to lose our pointing lock. Uh, this was the plan for how we would step through the sky. And uh, so in the first year, we'll be hitting uh, the poles and then marching down towards the plane of the ecliptic. Oh, I forgot to mention that. The other thing that we're avoiding here, which is this zone here, uh, is the ecliptic plane. We really want to avoid uh, the zodiacal light. Uh, it just makes the measurements a little more difficult. So. By the end of its first year, the data from Euclid will be almost an order of magnitude better in what it can tell us about dark energy by mapping out how dark matter is distributed in the universe than everything that has been done to date. Uh, so we are incredibly hopeful and excited about what's, what's going to happen. And I guess I'll just close by saying that sort of, you know, this is again, sort of a European mission, but it's a huge international collaboration and NASA is playing a significant role in it. You know, we're contributing to the science analysis. We delivered one of the infrared, the, the infrared camera, and our team is working very closely with our European Space Agency colleagues on, you know, every part of the data analysis. So it's a really outstanding example of what, you know, the kind of international collaboration that really shine, you know, makes science shine. And the other thing worth mentioning is that we're going to do a bigger version of these experiments from the ground and again from space in a few years. And so 
those of us at NASA are treating this as an opportunity to learn how to really do this kind of challenging science analysis on high quality data so that by the time we get to Nancy Grace Roman, uh, we'll be really good at it. So I realize we're a little bit early, uh, but I'm gonna wind up there. So this is a link to the Euclid Space Agency's uh, blog post on the subject where you can find these and other uh, early release images from Euclid and sort of follow how the, the spacecraft uh, is succeeding, we hope, in the mission as it goes on. And I will stop there and we can go to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Huff. Okay, let's check in the room. Yes, I have a hand. It'll take me a few minutes to get up the stairs to people with the microphone. Okay. Sounds like a wonderful satellite. Um, what was the filter that was used for the optical? So the optical has a custom broadband filter that's centered around one micron. Uh, it's essentially designed as just a huge light bucket because we're looking at gotcha. uh, really faint galaxies. So, What um, is the typical cadence at which you will look at a given field? How long will you dwell on one? How will you keep coming back to it? How, how does that work? So each field is gonna be visited four times. And uh, the exact cadence will depend on where on the sky we're looking. There are a small number of deep fields that will get up to 100 exposures that cover about 40 square degrees, if I remember correctly. And uh, those fields will be useful both uh, to do some time domain observations, although that's not the main purpose of it, but mainly they'll be useful to tell us, you know, in most of the sky, we don't get to know what the ground truth is, and we're doing a really sensitive measurement. And having a few deep fields where we really, really hit them very hard helps us sort of know, uh, sort of calibrate the measurements that we're trying to do. Um, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind, I, I didn't dwell on this, but this telescope is undersampled. So uh, the PSF is you know, not quite large enough that you get a, a fully informative image of it in every exposure. And that means two things. The first is that we actually, unlike most ground-based telescopes and most surveys have been done so far, we actually have to rely very much on a physical model of the spacecraft and its optics to, to understand and calibrate our measurements. And the second is that, you know, because a single image isn't fully sampled, uh, we actually rely on having all four of the epochs uh, available to analyze in order to get all the information that's there. Um, one of the things we've learned from the Kepler and the test spacecrafts is that um, having, well, time series photometry on a humongous selection of objects, and if you're going to be visiting uh, 40 square degrees, everything going down horrendously faint for 100 um, uh, epochs, um, uh, that, that sounds for, for many different applications. That sounds wonderful. Um, is there any plan for like tests to um, have uh, the, the mission produce photometry of everything in the field for every image and putting that online? Yes. So we will have separate photometry for everything in every image. Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to be released, but in general, the principle is that you should be able to reconstruct everything about that you could have gotten uh, from the raw images from the publicly released photometry. Is so that going I think, to be done? Go ahead. Is that going to be done by uh, a, a yearly or a couple year data release like Gaia, or would that be once a month like with TESS? It'll be uh, every couple of years. So this is not an instrument that you want to build an external follow-up campaign around. However, I'll point out that if you're really interested in time domain observations, uh, it's going to be very hard to beat Vera Rubin. So that'll start a little later than Euclid, but it's a much bigger telescope. And for time domain stuff, uh, you care a little bit less about having very high resolution images because you can always ask, you know, what has changed between these two subsequent images and something will always show up, right? Uh, and so I think uh, for that reason, uh, Euclid is just not going to add as much value for time domain observations as its peer surveys will. Other questions? That's okay. It will take me just a minute. Okay, we have a second question. Um, so this mission and telescope, the six-year mission, looks like you're trying to map all the mass 
and the dark matter that you can, how is that going to help you? I know how that would help you refine the estimate for that gamma, that repulsive force, but how does it help you explain what's causing it? Right. Okay. So we're a long way from actually having, being confident that we have a theory that can finally explain dark energy. The way to think about this is that we don't even have answers to the most basic questions you could ask. For example, does dark energy change in time or doesn't it? Is it a constant spatially or isn't it? Euclid is the smallest thing you can build that will actually give you a precise answer to that question for the range of variation that we might expect theoretically. And it can do a bit better than that. But I think what we expect to have at the end of this is a set of measurements that will rule out whether well, that will tell us whether dark energy is changing in time or not, and by how much or not. But a final physical theory is probably still in the distant future. And the reason for that, you know, part of the reason for that is that if you think about what we're doing here, even though we're mapping the entire universe, uh, the, the kinds of observations that we're taking give us relatively, like they're relatively sparse, right? You know, uh, I don't have, uh, like I would in a particle physics experiment, you know, lots of detailed data where I can sort of watch dark energy particles bounce off of other things and see their detailed properties. You know, here I get, because I have to, I have to survey so much of the universe to see something. I get, you know, a relatively small statistical sample. We have just the one universe and you have to see huge chunks of it and compare them in order to see what's changing. So uh, it won't answer the questions, but it will give us sort of, uh, it'll really allow us to, to actually start, I think, building well-informed models of dark energy. Other questions in the room? I'm not seeing any other hands at this point. So I think we will go to Zoom. All right, and Eric, you can probably bring them up on chat as well, but I'm gonna read them one at a time just so that I've got them in the room here, but they may not be, be able to be read. So the, we'll start from the very beginning here. Um, Karen Liptak asks, how does DESI at Kitt Peak fit into the search for dark energy? That's a great question. Thank you, Karen. So I was focusing in this talk on the imaging missions that are focused on mapping out dark matter. However, uh, if in fact, I'm just going to share my slides again to go back to make this point. So um, let's see here. There we go. All right, so I put this slide up to sort of show a couple of things. You know, this is what you would see if you could see where the dark matter was. And, but you can't, you just get to see the galaxies. And the strategy that missions like Euclid and the Vera Rubin and um, Nancy Grace Roman are taking is they're trying to infer where the dark matter is by looking at gravitational lensing. The other thing you could try to do is say, well, Maybe that's really hard. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at where the galaxies are and just make a map of the galaxies I can see. And then from that, try to make inferences about dark energy. So that is the kind of experiment that DESI, which is a large spectroscopic instrument operating at Kitbeek, is trying to do. So you get different information from that kind of measurement. So uh, instead of being able to tell where the dark matter is, you can indirectly tell, uh, you know, detect its effects because of the impact it has on the motions of galaxies, which DESI is sensitive to. The other thing you can do with a survey like DESI is because there are, there are patterns that are imprinted into the distribution of galaxies at very large scales that you, you can calculate the size of. If you can see them on the sky, you can work out, you know, it's like having a ruler, that you know the physical size of and putting it some distance away, a standard ruler, they call it. Um, and that lets you sort of map more accurately how the universe has expanded over its history. So DESI provides a complementary set of measurements focusing on the stuff that we can see uh, to what the imaging surveys, uh, Euclid, Vera Rubin, and Nancy Grace Roman will provide. Okay, thank you. Um, Matthew asks, uh, what is the Euclid telescope F ratio? So uh, I will leave questions about the focal ratio uh, and uh, the, so the basic architecture, I think, uh, for um, uh, 
since those I think are, are generally easily Googleable uh, for, for later. We can come back to them if we want, because um, I think some of these things in the chat might need uh, longer explanations. Okay. Uh, let's see, Matthew also asks, since Euclid is an infrared telescope, does it use a cry cryogenic EOR for cooling? So is Euclid cryogenically cooled? Um, I don't remember. I do know that the main limitation on the lifetime of the mission isn't cooling, but rather propelling. So those Lagrange point two orbits are uh, nearly stable, but not perfectly. And so Euclid has to continuously fire very small station keeping thrusters to stay in those orbits. And depending on how efficiently it was inserted by SpaceX, uh, those will take a variable amount of time. You'll have to expend those at a variable rate. Uh, so we think based on what happened that we'll actually be able to last the full six years and a fair bit after that. We're not gonna be limited by cryogenics. Okay, um, Ray asks, can the Euclid measurements determine if the accelerating force is proportional to distance, distance squared or what? That's a great question. So part of the answer to that question depends a little bit on how, right. So let me go back to that slide where I put up the equations. So I gave this as sort of a schematic example. And what I've done is I've said, we're gonna take the inverse square law and we're gonna add something that is proportional to the distance between things. And what this means is that this force, the second term, gets stronger as things get farther apart, right? So, uh, you could imagine saying, well, maybe this doesn't go just linearly as R, because this is hard to detect. We haven't measured it that well. Maybe it's a different mathematical function that's not just linear in R. Right now, the data aren't good enough to tell the difference between this and something more complex. Uh, we can say it doesn't go as an inverse square law because it gets stronger as things get farther apart. You need that in order to explain an accelerating universe. But beyond that, we just don't have the data to really say. All right. Uh, Vernon asks, what are the theories that give three different curves of clumpiness versus age of the universe? So, uh, right. So we put up the plot that Vernon is asking about. So everyone can see it. Okay. So these three curves, represent what we would say is a plausible range of variation. And in this case, they, that doesn't mean that they have three different discrete theories that correspond to each of these curves. Rather, it means that the data that we have, uh, rather it means that we, we have a pretty good idea that whatever the correct theory is of dark energy, if it's different from the way we think the universe works, the thing it has to change is the strength of gravity, and gravity affects how fast structure grows. So you can take that and say, OK, given what we already know, uh, what we've already measured about how the universe is expanding and how things are moving in it, what range of variability in that growth of that clumpiness curve is allowed by current data? And that's the range that I'm representing here. So there are other theories of gravity. Um, there are hundreds of them. And they generally produce phenomenology like what I'm showing here, which is small changes to the, the growth of cosmic structure over time. Um, but this is meant to be, you know, pretty representative of the kind of phenomena we're looking for, but not universal. We really just want to measure that growth curve over its history. All right. Um... Doug Summers asks, how will the team define what a normal ground truth galaxy should look like given the spectrum of so many possible shapes? And how will the team disentangle localized sources of shape perturbations from true lensing effects? How will type that, one and type two categorization errors be handled? Lots in there. So that's a fantastic question. And that really gets to the heart of what makes gravitational lensing so difficult. So. If I look at a single galaxy image, if it's not strongly lensed, I can't tell if it's lensed at all. You know, it might just have a particular ellipticity. However, galaxies that are widely separated from each other on the sky don't physically impact each other. And so whatever their random shapes are, this one and this one should be uncorrelated with each other. 
And so what that means is though, even though a single galaxy can't tell us anything about lensing, if we have a whole mess of them, we can look for statistical patterns of the kind that can only be produced by something in the foreground, lensing all of them, all right? So the, the way that the gravitational lensing measurements work here is that we don't, you know, we essentially have to have to look for these statistical patterns. Now, the question about ground truth is also a really good one because since these measurements are so subtle, you know, we think we know what we're doing, but, but the effects are all very small, right? What if there's a tiny error in the Euclid optics that stretches things a little bit? That could look like a gravitational lensing signal. What if, you know, uh, there's uh, just a bug in the code that we used to do the measurements that stretches things very slightly when we, when we calculate their ellipticities, right? How would we know? So the way that we do that is we try to build very, very accurate simulations of the data that Euclid will have, things that look essentially indistinguishable to the naked eye from what a real Euclid image looks like. And then we try and we test everything we do on those kinds of simulations. Uh, we introduce errors in the simulations in the model for how the telescope optics work and see if we can tell if, if they were there, uh, uh, if we could recover the fact that those errors are there. So the main tool we use is this extensive simulation effort uh, to test uh, every part of the measurement pipeline. But you might say, well, what if there's something you haven't thought about putting in your simulations? And there, that's a problem too, right? So the, the best answer we can give to that is that we're not doing just one dark energy mission, but three. And each of these missions has very different strengths and weaknesses. So even if there's something very subtle that goes wrong with Euclid, it won't be the same very subtle thing that goes wrong with Nancy Grace Roman or Vera Rubin. And so the end goal is to take the data from all three of these missions and see if we get the same answer from them and use each of them to sort of correct and look for mistakes in the others. And Matthew uh, commented, said a Google AI answer on the F ratio says the space telescope has a coarse telescope design with a focal length of 24.5 meters. The telescope has a useful pupil diameter of 1.2 meters and a field of view offset of 0.47 degrees. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Mike Murray asked, tell us uh, just a bit about the mission's use of spectroscopy. Great talk, thanks. Fantastic, okay. So let's go back to the spectroscopic image that I had put up before. So uh, I think I talked a little bit in the answer to the question about DESI, about how uh, DESI is taking spectra. We use the pattern that Hubble discovered gives us the relationship between distance and redshift uh, to measure the distances to things. And from that, we can build a map of where the galaxies are. So Euclid will be able to do the same kind of experiment that DESI is doing. It's getting spectra for galaxies, measuring their redshifts, and then making a map of where galaxies are in the universe. Now, the way that works is actually showing you in this image on the right. So what you're seeing is, is an image through a grism. So this is a dispersive element that you put in front of the imager. And it has a similar effect to just putting a prism in front, of a, in front of an image. So each vertical bar here is the spectrum of a galaxy in an image like this. These aren't exactly registered, so it's going to be hard to look at this and say you know, exactly which thing it's coming from. But we, we know what that mapping is. Um, but if you were to sort of look at the way the brightness varies along one of these vertical bars, uh, you would see the spectrum of light from a galaxy. And from the pattern of emission lines and absorption lines there, we can determine the rest of these things. So Euclid's using this near infrared spectrograph to make a map using measured redshifts of galaxies of large scale structure that will be, you know, like DESI, complementary to what we're going to get from the imaging data. All right, just a couple more here. Uh, Matthew commented or provided a uh, link for cryogenic cooling of infrared detectors on spacecraft. So that's in the chat if anybody wants to check it out. Awesome. Thomas uh, O'Keefe. Dark matter bends light. Does dark energy also bend light? Will Euclid give us any insight on dark matter versus dark energy? Okay, so that's a great question. So right now, as things stand, we have no reason to think that dark matter and dark energy have anything to do with each other. Dark matter behaves like just a normal particle that doesn't happen to interact through the strong and weak nuclear forces or through the electromagnetic force. Uh, dark energy doesn't even behave like a form of matter. So in order to explain dark energy, right, you know, where the acceleration gets stronger as things get far farther apart, you need to have something 
whose density does not go down as the space that it's occupying is fans. That's extremely weird, right? So we don't even have any reason to think it is a kind of substance. Now, in terms of does it bend light? Well, a key thing about gravitational lensing is that in order to get lensing that you can see, there has to, the thing that is doing the lensing has to vary across the sky in some way. If it's a constant everywhere, it can't produce a lensing effect that you can observe. And right now, we don't have any evidence. We would like to find some, but we don't have any evidence that dark energy is different anywhere. It seems to be consistent, at least at the level of precision we can measure today, with something that is constant across the universe. All right, and last question on Zoom from Michael. Is there any chance we could find black holes in the foreground by seeing the lensing they might cause? Absolutely, yes. So a Euclid is not designed to do that. And the main reason it's gonna have a hard time doing that is that if you think about the relative speeds of a black hole passing in front of a distant background star, uh, that can change very, very quickly. That's a phenomenon called microlensing. Now, there's a lot of people doing this from the ground right now. Mm -hmm. um, but Nancy Grace Drummond will actually have a de dedicated program looking for microlensing. Now, it's mainly targeted not at finding black holes, but rather at finding planets around other stars. And it's gonna be one of the first uh, ways that we have of actually finding Earth-like planets. So I would encourage you to sort of look that up, but uh, um, microlensing of black holes is absolutely a thing that people look for. Okay, we have one more question on Zoom. Um, Ray asks, can dark energy be considered as a potential energy being converted to, kin to kinetic in some dimension? I mean, sort of, yeah, the short answer is yes. But I wanna caveat that by saying, right now there are literally hundreds of published physical models for dark energy and we cannot tell the difference between them. And many of them invent strange and exotic new physics. Some of them are minor modifications to things like fields that we already see in particle physics. We just don't have any ability to tell which is right. And we, we don't have uh, rich enough data to really see complicated phenomenology. Yet. So that's the kind of thing we're hoping to learn more of. Okay, I think we don't have any que questions on Facebook. Any other questions in the room at this time? Okay, this one toward the back. So it'll take me a minute and we will definitely get that one. On the down. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, did you say behind Perseus there was millions or billions of objects? Oh, in that the Euclid Perseus image, slide. in that Euclid image of, of Perseus, I can go back to it if you want. Uh, here we go. Right. So in that Perseus image, I said there will be tens of thousands of background galaxies. So every little faint dot that you can see in this image is a distant background galaxy. And all the bright, the bright big stuff is foreground Perseus galaxies, our cluster members. Okay, well, thank you. And also, where did you get that cool shirt? Butterflies, dragonfly. <laughs> this is okay. on the uh, clearance rack at Men's Warehouse. Thank you. You're very welcome. I, and we did have a thank you that was sent to you on, on um, Facebook, I mean, on uh, Zoom as well. But we we all really appreciate your coming tonight, Dr. Huff, and we appreciate all this interesting, you know, um, answers to questions that you were able to give us. Um, we also appreciate your representing Arizona so well at JPL, and and please keep doing that. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that we are going to really need for you to do, I think, is to come back sometime and give us an update. Um, if you would be able to do that, we would really appreciate that. I would be very happy to. I think the picture will continue to change as we get more Euclid data. And I think I'm hopeful that we'll have uh, exciting discoveries to report on just in the next year or two. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. We appreciate everything. All right. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'm May Smith, the AAA president. And for those of you who um, 
are attending via Facebook, I want to give you a reminder that we are here every first Friday of the month at 6.30. We've had Jim Noel, Terry Lappin, and Susan Noel helping us with technology tonight. Um, and we hope that you will take a look at our website at tucsonastronomy.org. Um, there's certainly an opportunity there for you to join the club. Um, there's an opportunity for you to donate. And there's lots of different kinds of astronomy information that, um, that you may have some fun just sort of wandering around and looking through. So we hope you'll take the opportunity to do that and that we will see you next month.